Yeah, everybody's gotten like busier. Busier lately. All right. So last uh, this Monday we talked about makeup, makeup artists, makeup assistants, and key makeup. And now we're talking about special effects makeup and special effects makeup artists. This stuff comes from nyib.edu. And it will be letter J in the syllabus under special effects makeup or SFX makeup. So SFX makeup artists or special effects makeup artists create the appearance of injuries, bruises. Um, well, actually, I think I have a picture. So anything like this, they'll be the ones to make it. Injuries, bruises, any kind of mutilations, like limbs coming off or things wrong with the person, the stuff getting detached from their body, any kind of deformities that a person might have. I was going to make a joke. I'll make it after the recording just in case. All right. And sometimes they're the ones who handle aging, depending on how much needs to be done to um, get the person to look like a different age. So it depends on how many years you're trying to advance them compared to what, they, what age they are originally. Uh, so aging can, can, if it's not too much being done, then it will go to makeup artists. But if there's a lot that needs to be done, a lot of extra stuff that needs to be applied, um, then special effects makeup will take over and do it. They also do bullet wounds. So anything that you see when somebody gets shot in the head, if they're bleeding, any kind of cuts or anything like that, they'll be the ones to do that to make it look realistic. Like I said, some cuts, different types of cuts, and they use like latex, silicone, scar wax, different it materials. Real, it is a real like art. Like it is not easy to make it look at least passable. The amount of work and detail that goes into it from what I from what I saw and like it can it can really elevate your film just that extra detail or, or that extra um, investment in the right equipment and materials it really elevates your film and makes it look a lot more more expensive a lot better higher quality just um, your practical effects like the difference that that makes you know yeah definitely and it's and it, they don't um it depends on if it's supposed to be like an old scar or if it's supposed to be cut in camera because cut in camera there's a lot more that has to be done um they have to put a patch of fake skin they have to blend it to the person's skin they have to make it look like it's not sticking out and then they have to let it be torn open with some kind of tool where actual liquid blood comes out so it looks like the person's bleeding and so there's quite a bit that has to be done if they want to capture a cut that's visibly done on camera that has blood, then fresh. Whereas doing a scar or something that's a little older is easier to do, but it still isn't. It's not easy to do, but it's easier than the other than doing it uh, for camera. Also, also now with the internet and with Amazon and stuff like that, it is a lot more accessible for you to buy equipment for that. And it's not as expensive as it once was. Some things still are, but a lot of it is pretty affordable. And it really just takes skill and knowing how to do it now more than uh, some. I, mean, I would say, like, it's still, you know, it's like they have to be makeup artists, but they also have to have extra materials to do the special effects makeup. So they, it's going to be as expensive as a makeup artist, but then additionally, it has to be even more so yeah. because they have uh, that extra was a, material. A lot more than it was. A lot more accessible than, than it was and that people imagine it being. Like, yeah, it's still going to be expensive. Things are expensive. But from what I saw, at least in like the videos and the articles that I was that we were looking at, um, it seemed like it's less than I thought it would be, I guess, maybe because my expectations were higher just doing like a quick amazon research or whatever i was like oh that's still pricey but i don't know why in my brain i just thought it would be a lot more does that make sense yeah yeah 
And it definitely, obviously, you know, it depends on everything like brands and, you know, what the most professional one is considered. And even though if something else might come close or be as good, it's just the brand name might take it to a new level of price and stuff like that goes into it as well, of course. And there's also the fact of like what kind of movie you're going for. I don't feel like every movie it needs to be uber realistic and uber perfect. As like there are some films that they either don't take themselves too seriously or they are like unapologetically a little campy or like their story is so good that it 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 does or like certain camera angles and camera movements hide certain special practical effects a little bit better um so that's another thing to consider it's like yes do the best you can but think about like what kind of movie you want and what kind of ways you can play around with that if you have a smaller budget let's say that's what I was thinking of in the moment at least yeah and so like uh if you have it if you're working on an independent project and you're not gonna be able to afford all the most expensive stuff you're not going to be able to explore the most, afford the most expensive uh, professional out there to do it right. Um, there are ways, like like you're saying, to to you know move the camera around to not show it too close. Maybe say, okay, never mind. The cut doesn't get seen in camera. You know, some things you have to go around whenever you're on a lower budget to to make it work, and it still has this a good effect. It might not have the exact same effect, but it still has a similar effect, the similar interaction. We understand the person's getting cut. So it's mostly about the emotion and about what is happening rather than the look of it. The look of it's cool, but if it's not coming cr- coming across as realistic from the actor's performance and the way the story is developing, then it doesn't matter how realistic or how fake it looks because it's it's not nobody's gonna buy at that point and you can play around with camera angles you can play around with the character the the actor's performance with um sound effects like there are other ways around it as well right yeah so special effects makeup artists will work on all of those things they'll also be doing any kind of burn makeup um anything that looks like somebody was in an accident they were burned there in the hospital those kinds of things, they'll do a bunch of that type of stuff. They might also change people's facial features to make them look like a completely different person, giving them a different appearance. So if you see somebody that's ugly in a film, it could be that they're wearing prosthetics and makeup and stuff to make themselves look ugly like this, or it could be that the person was casted for that role. One thing that I wanted to like just touch on is that not all of us can like afford every single person of every department. So like if you if if you're going to try to get a, uh, someone who's a makeup artist but is um not like as like super professional been working 10 years um to have to do the research like in our case um, our makeup artist was in was in school and stuff, and she's very talented and and wonderful, but she wasn't exactly like used to that kind the kind of uh, makeup that we uh, needed. But she did her research. We helped. We did ours. We communicated. Um, gave her like picture ideas. Um, so doing your research and seeing what it would realistically look like really makes a difference and really helps not only to give your makeup artist an idea of what you're going for but to also make it look more realistic and see okay if I'm doing a burn what does an actual burn look like so that it doesn't just like look so much like prosthetic or like makeup to where it completely takes you out of it unless you know that's what you're going for Right. So research is, is key, I would say, because I know that a lot of us in the indie scene, especially, we can't always afford to have every single professional of everything. And um, sometimes most of, we're, we're going to be just like we are working with people that are either new or have a little less experience. And research can go a long way in, in making up for it. Yeah. Even in in the professional field, they should be researching and they should be having reference photos and things like that. They shouldn't be just going off of what they feel like because you have to have something 
a source material to go off of to make it look as realistic as possible. So even in like larger sets, they should definitely be doing that. Independent sets, yes, if you're gonna hire somebody, if you're not, research is still gonna really help get the look and feel of it down so you can get it as close to that as possible, even if you're not able to do exactly what you were wanting, like Priscilla was saying. Um, special effects makeup uses film and stage makeup, as well as prosthetics made of silicone, latex, or rubber. So they have a large amount of materials that they have to get. They have to use different brushes for each person, just like a regular makeup artist. But then they also have to have certain tools um, and materials like silicone, rubber, or latex to apply these different looks to get because you're basically building on a new layer of skin so that you can then tear it off or deform it or make it look older with wrinkles or make it bleed out, have a hidden layer of um, liquid underneath, make it look like it's burned or make them look like a completely different person. Also special effects makeup artists, depending on the set, they may, um, oh, I thought I had a picture of this. Oh, yeah. So they may uh, make some robotic moving parts on top of the prosthetics or something like that, some mixture of it, where it's actually movable. Sometimes that'll depend on wh what set you're on, and it'll go to a different department to really help them out with that aspect of it. Sometimes it's just visual effects now, or CGI and entirely, but they still try to get it as close to it as possible. And sometimes they still do actual moving parts um, to, to get it as realistic on set as possible. And then the visual effects department takes over and just enhances it instead of trying to create it from scratch. So prosthetics are anything that is attachable or removable. So anything like the, the ears of an elf, or the horns on a devil or a zabrak or a demon or something that are attached to somebody's skull, all of those things would be considered prosthetics. And that's all gonna fall under the special effects makeup department or the special effects makeup artist, depending on if it's just one person or a team of people. They need to be able to work with fake blood, creating realistic cuts and wounds, live camera. Special effects often work in sci-fi creating other species. Oh, so they need to be able to like make something like this where it's gonna bleed on camera. It's gonna look realistic as he's sewing himself together or as realistic as you can get it. Um, and the color and everything has to be realistic too. So they have to be okay with working with that type of stuff. They have to, they usually work in sci-fi to create other species, other aliens and things like that to make them unique. That's a lot of a different material latex and stuff to give them different shapes of heads and different um, feet, facial features than uh, we have. They also create monsters for horror or stuff like ghouls, creatures, zombies, and more. In fantasy, they might create other species too, like elves and things like that, um, fairies, something else. But those are the usual ones that they work in, um, just because that's the one that requires the most special effects makeup. It's either hot horror, sci-fi, or fantasy. But they could also be working in any other genre that needs, you know, an action movie would need bullet wounds or would need cuts and stuff like that. So they will work in there. Um, it's just the majority of their work comes from sci-fi, uh, horror, or fantasy. Special effects makeup needs to know molding, sculpting, and casting techniques. Prosthetic makeup is actually a, a part of special effects makeup. So in certain sets, if you have a really large special effects team, like you have to create a bunch of different people that look like a different race or something like that, um, the prosthetic makeup artist or artists would have their own like they'd have their own part within the special effects makeup department so sometimes it can be a whole department a whole group of people other times it can be just one or two people depending on how much is needed to be done and what the budget is 
but the prosthetics makeup, obviously they focus on prosthetics, which are the things that can be attached, add, added or removed, while special effects makeup would work on things that are actually applied to somebody's face, um, like bruises, cuts, and injuries and things like that. Special effects makeup as a whole focuses more on applying makeup to an actor while prosthetics are focused on adding removable parts or parts that aren't actually on the actor. The makeup needs to be skin friendly, non-damaging, and the glue that's used to attach like scalps and other materials and other prosthetics to the person's skull uh, need to also be skin friendly and non-damaging. So they have to make sure that whatever materials they're using, again, just like regular makeup, they have to make sure the person doesn't have any allergies. They aren't going to have an allergic reaction to this stuff. Um, and they also have to make sure it's not gonna damage their skin when they pull it off. It's not gonna rip off a layer of skin or hurt somebody's ear or rip off some of their hair. All that stuff they have to be really careful with because they're messing with people's faces and people's heads and to make sure that it's not gonna damage them in any way or cause any kind of negative reaction. Sometimes the artists might get pre-made parts and apply them. So they might get something like this if they're using horns and it's just like little pre-made um, prosthetics. So they're not making it from scratch. They're actually buying, a, uh, buying it from somewhere and then they are applying it to the person's head and they are um, blending it into their skin. And then other times they are going to be creating it all the way from scratch. So they'll be taking their materials, their latex and other things and shaping it, painting it and doing whatever else is needed to, or applying makeup to it, to uh, get it to be a certain color in a certain way so that it attaches and look, blends in with the person's skull. So depending on that as well, it depends on um, how long that's going to take for one, how many, how many of them they need. Again, if they're making an entire race of people that have five horns on their head, then they need to decide what's gonna be the cheaper route and what's going to be the quicker route and, and then decide which route to take uh, or you know, what, what to compromise with. Because if you don't have enough people to be able to create them all from scratch, then you have to compromise somewhere on that. But if those don't look as real and they're not gonna be as realistic, then you have to figure out who are we going to apply the less realistic ones to, who's not gonna be in camera as much, Obviously like extras and stuff, they're gonna get it, but side characters who are in less than the lead actors, if all of them have this, uh, these horns, then you have to figure out which ones need the most realistic ones and which ones don't. And that's something that the special effects team will, will think of and they'll discuss with the um, production designer and the director to make sure that they get the go ahead to go ahead and do their plan of what they, what they think it will work best. To create special effects makeup, you usually can't just hire a makeup artist. It usually has to be an actual special effects makeup artist because it's a different role and they have different, like they have different kits. So they have different sets of materials, obviously, but they also just have different skill sets that they've learned and have uh, honed in on over the years. So a regular makeup artist can sometimes do what a special effects makeup artist can, but Oftentimes you're gonna to have to get somebody separate who is actually specialized in it if you want it to look good, if you want it to look as best as it can, because that person has experience in it, they've trained in it, they've researched it, and they have the materials for it usually. Does anybody have any questions or anything to add or comments on special effects makeup or SFX makeup? I was trying to remember something that I remember I I thought of. I really should write down notes when we're not able to study together because otherwise I'll forget everything. Um, I was just going to say that like, so these prosthetics are probably a mix of the prosthetic and then makeup on the prosthetic, right? To give it more- Either that or paint, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. 
because I can't imagine them looking very realistic, especially with having to blend them into the person's face and, and making it look like one cohesive thing that should be there. Right. And that is why they need so much different makeup because they have to have all these different colors because the bottoms of these are really dark brown. And if you're putting them on actors that don't have that color of skin, then you have to uh, sort of blend the areas or at least like gradually blend the areas to that, or you have to change the prosthetics to make them a different color. You have to do something and either way, it's going to require a different color of, of makeup and usually a lot of different skin tone makeups to try to match them to other people's skin. And there's so many different actors with different skin tones and each individual person has their, has several shades to their skin, yeah. uh, even whether you notice it or not that yeah they have to have so many different ones to to blend just, everything together you, like get, oh i get it now why it takes like six hours to do yeah it or takes a while and that's why they, they are also there from a really early like 3 a.m to 7 p.m because they have to be there to apply it and they have to be there to take it off of the actor later on you can't just leave a, an actor in all of this type of uh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oof, yeah, taking it off. Oh, that must be annoying too. And they have to take it off gently and carefully and make sure they're using whatever materials to get it off without, again, without damaging any and skin every or anything like that. I, because these I, things are often glued to either the person's skin with like skin glue or some kind of glue that's uh, skin safe. Mm -hmm. And, or it's like to the bald caps and whatever else. And the bald caps are glued to the person's face so that they can blend it as as. Best and, pe and people have move. different skin types as well. It might be skin friendly, but if someone is known to have very sensitive prone skin, that could cause a rash. Or you could cause issues as well, which is a whole other can of worms. Right. And so that's why they always need to ask and, and figure out if any of the actors I, have any allergies or anything that they know of that's going to affect I don't, what they I don't use. remember if we saw this or not. Um, but I would imagine they would probably have to do like a test before the day of filming as well to like see what they're going to need, what they're gonna use so that they don't have to bring like an entire arsenal of things to the set, just, just what they actually need. Yeah, um, and that depends on from production to production if the, how, how much pre-planning went into it, how much, usually there are tests, um, but depending on the budget, depending on how many people there are and when you are able to hire them, like if somebody drops out last minute or drops out a week and you're looking for somebody for, for one week and you get mm -hmm. them a day before, you know, certain things like that will obviously cause it to not have as much preparation in it where the makeup yeah. artist might need to bring like their whole kit. But Other I times, know. usually if you can, you want to do test, uh, t makeup tests with both this and with just regular makeup. And you want to do screen tests with the makeup applied to see if it looks good. So if you're if you're able to, definitely test it and make sure it looks good on camera. Just because it looks good in person doesn't mean it's going to look good on camera. And it also gives the makeup artists or the special effects makeup artists time to look at the actor's skin and figure out what can be done with it and make sure that they can match whatever they have to their skin and. And all so that. I would imagine, um, again, I, I don't remember if this was in it or not because it's, it's been a while, but um, I would imagine that when it comes to fantasy, anything that has like a high um, number of prosthetics or makeup, stuff like that, I would imagine pre-production, it would have to be added um, extra time for makeup tests and a camera test and see how it reacts to the camera and if they need to change anything. I would imagine that that, that they would have to fit in the schedule time for that as well, if you can. Yeah, definitely. And anytime you can, they always like schedule that, especially on the bigger sets, they'll do all sorts of tests and all sorts of things to make sure everything's gonna work. On the lower budget side, it really depends from production to production what they're going to do and how much how much preparation they're doing in it. Usually you're going to have concept art and you're going to have some kind of idea of the look you're going for, but you're not really going to, uh, on certain sets, especially the lowest budgets, um, you don't have as much money to be able to get people to be there to do all those tests. So you just yeah. have to wing it and try it on the day. 
And that's why I say if you can afford it, even if it's mm -hmm. not on set, if it's like at the person's house or at um, a neutral location, some somewhere where you can, oh, hey, honey, what the heck? I was just scrolling through. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm a little queasy with blood, even though I know it's fake. Um, and, I, and I was zoomed in as well. So <laughs> I was zoomed in, next thing I know. But uh, I, would, I would say that if you can find a location just to try it out, just to see how it would look on camera, okay, we're going to need to um, use a, a, a wider lens or zoom out a little bit, or, oh, we're going to need to make it look more like darker or lighter or like just if if you're able to schedule in a day just to do that just to test that out even if it's just a day just to see how it looks see how um the, it looks on camera i feel like that would be so invaluable like it, it would it would be so valuable in the long run you know yeah and that's why that's why a lot of people will just say, you know, independent films, try your best to do pre-production work as much as you can, because especially if you're doing something like this type of stuff, you want to make sure it's going to work and not have the problem on set when you have all of your people there, your whole crew, and you're all set up to shoot. And now you're going to run behind a production day because that's going to cost a lot more than, than trying to get yeah. an actor and a makeup artist on set with the light. And, you know, it's a less okay. crew and stuff like that needed whenever you're doing tests. I feel like for us, that was something that I that I really struggled with because we were on a very tight budget and tight schedule. And I wish we would have gotten one day just for um, setting it up and just for makeup tests because that kind of, for what was, um, it kind of pushed us back a little bit. Definitely. And that's why you live and you learn. <laughs> you, you do it, you learn, and then the next time you do it, you hopefully you don't make the same mistake. Well, that's yeah. that's the thing. Like, um, not saying that you guys are amateurs or anything like that, but like... I, I can say I am. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm just saying, like, you learn from your lesson and you're, you're obviously hitting this mark where you're saying, I wish we had an extra day, which is the ones, the projects that do take that extra day, it shows like it's like the yeah. quality is so much better because they actually took that time. Like one of the, the more professional sets I've been the on. The difference one day makes, right? Yeah, the, the, the more professional sets I've been on, especially as a PA, like I was a PA on one of these um, big, big productions. And uh, the first day wasn't even, I wasn't even doing anything PA wise. I was just kind of just there. Like they were just paying me for nothing and I was just following them around. And pretty much what they were doing was um, not location. They already had the locations, but they were, you know, going to each location, developing a light plan, seeing this, that, and the other, what kind of lights, and, you know, they, they did all that that first day. And then when the day of the next day, that's when everything was like, but it went so smoothly. Like, that's the thing I, that I took from that was like, wow. All that stuff they did on the first day, it seemed boring and it seemed kind of like useless, but w w the next day kind of showed like why they did all that extra work. Because that till this day, it probably been the most smoothest running set I've ever been on because like everything was on schedule. And then like we had lunch on time and everything was on schedule. And I was just like, yo. Um, so it does make a difference that extra day to um do the the like priscilla was saying test the lighting and make sure you know everything is going to look good before you get on set because you never know how long you don't want to get on set and then all of a sudden oh this is going to take a lot longer than we thought because you now we have to do this that and the other so, right yeah yeah and that's why taking those extra days the prep days getting everything ready beforehand and testing and everything testing out the equipment testing out makeup, testing out, blocking, you know, if you can, and just testing everything out before you get onto actual ready to shoot is really important. And that's what a lot of uh, independent filmmakers and stuff don't take into account because they just want to try to do it as cheaply as possible because it is expensive. So it's, it's understandable, but really taking that extra time, those extra days to plan and prep is, is really important. You don't know how long pre-production, like setting up is going to take until you're there. That's the God honest truth. Like we planned as much as possible. We practiced 
um, setting up everything. But at the end of the day, like you're not, if you're not in that set, if you're not, if you don't have the people there, if you don't, if you're not on that schedule, like so many things can go wrong. So many things can be different. So just having that extra day makes an enormous difference. And the reason that a lot of people don't think it's because a lot of us, and that's not necessarily like, uh, like uh, I can I can see where it's coming from because we're focused on the production, which is like that was the main hurdle was getting it to production, right? And now that it's in production, it's just like no, we need to film, we need to do this, we need to do that. And so sometimes the prepping, it, some stuff can fall through the wayside in the battle to finally get it made, to finally get it in production and things can get lost along the way or things can get um, ignored like oh we should have thought of this or we should have you know along the way but if there's anything that I've learned is that it's always worth it to give yourself an extra even if it's just one extra day because it makes a huge difference you will have time to prep and if there's any emergencies it's always better to be have more time than less at the end of the day yeah yeah all right yeah so usually when you have special <laughs> effects makeup you're going to have concept art you're going to have um that you're going to have talks with the artist you're going to they they should tell you or if you're the artist you should tell the director or the producer or somebody that uh how long you feel like it's going to take just like with regular makeup Special effects makeup artist that kind of runs the same way. Ooh, Tell him, uh, I think it's going to take this long. If you need this actor for this and that actor, I'm going to need another person if you need him for the same scene because I can only do one person at a time. I would also, uh, sorry, honey, I didn't mean to cut you off. I would also recommend that. Do not have that conversation two days before shooting, one day before, for goodness sake. Have that conversation for, like in advance as soon as you get them. Like if you have the actors, if you have the makeup artist, um, we tried to do this and thank God it made a huge difference. Um, just sit and like, or have a call um, or a Zoom call, a regular call, a meeting where you're like, okay, what are you going to need as a makeup artist? What can I help you with? What are the actors gonna need? Hey, actor, what's your skin type? I can, so I can forward this information to the makeup artist if, if they are not able to be in direct communication. Hey, can I forward your number to the makeup artist in case they have a question for you? Um, those things, talking about them, scheduling time to communicate about these things are essential. That was something that also was like made a huge difference in, in our experience and from what I've seen in the experience of a lot of people. Yeah, and so special effects makeup artists, the ones that you're paying that, um, that have done it before, they should be the ones to reach out and try to figure out the actors beforehand. They should be using concept art kind of showing what they're going for or basing off of concept art from a concept artist if you have one that um, is showing the idea you're going for and, and describing how realistic that's going to be or what needs to be done to make it look that way like oh this you know I know you want it to look like this but it's going to be that's going to make it look very their head is going to look very wide you know and then they can kind of describe what's going to happen and why because of what needs to be done to get that look and that's when those concept art pieces are taken and they are made into something a little more practical and realistic and changed for various reasons, one for creative reasons and another for logistical reasons to get it to be as close to what they were going for as possible, but also uh, make it look good on camera and on the person because each actor will have different skin tone, different hair color, different eye color. So certain shades of things and certain shapes might not look the best on different people because of the way their face is structured and other things like that. Also, certain colors complement different skin tones better. And also, yeah, different shapes will um, make the, the, it will make a huge difference, like the type of prosthetics you're putting will make a difference in making the face look even or lopsided or you have to be very careful as well that it isn't too big for the person's face or too small that it matches the look that they're going for but also that it doesn't end up like 
um, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically like taking over their whole face to where it, it the, you have to get the sizing right. If you've ever and, watched, uh, if you've ever watched any um, fan made projects on YouTube of Star Trek or Star Wars or anything that where they're gonna apply prosthetics, a lot of them, um, some of them are very good and some of them, they put on too much makeup to where the actor can't move their mouth and where it looks like their face is melting off. And oh, so there's certain ways to, to do it, to make it look better to whatever face structure the person has. And, you know, even though the character in a book might look like something, you sometimes it's just not practical. It's not realistic to make them look exactly the same as they do in their book form because of, it's just not going to work that, that way. Yeah, a lot of fantasy writers... Um, people that work for TV that do fantasy and stuff like that have said that, that you sometimes have to modify the look, the wardrobe, um, even the universe in some aspects to make it more practical for the scenes that you're shooting, for the look that, you're, that you are trying to get. Because it's, it's different writing something out and actually um, creating it in a real life scenario. Yeah, it's a lot more complicated and takes a lot more. Even doing a design, a concept art, a comic book art, yeah. those things are very different than you know what it would. Anime, and when you do anime to live action, a lot of that stuff looks ridiculous when it's when it's live action. So they change the shape of the armor, they change the shape of the character because it's just not going to work realistically for how the uh, anime comic or anime show showed it. So those are something, a lot of things that they take into account. And if you have a good special effects artist, they should be prepping and preparing and asking the actors those things. They should be talking to the director and the production designer, telling them how much time they're going to need or the first, uh, first assistant director to tell them how much time they're going to need for each thing and how to schedule it and to get it all ready to go because they are kind of over themselves. They are like they answer to the production designer, like all of, all of the art department, but with their own stuff, with their special effects makeup, they are in charge of how long it's going to take. They're in charge of the scheduling of when to do the actors and stuff like that, because they know, or they should know how long it's going to take them to do it on that person. So they're usually um, telling you all of this and working it out. And that's when the production designer or the producer, whoever wants to take over that schedule, usually the production designers over most art department stuff, uh, they'll take over figuring out the entire schedule for the actors and things like that. And then they'll convey that to, or relay that to the director, the producer, first assistant director. So whoever's doing the schedule can schedule that in and tell the actors when they need to be there for the casting calls and all of that. Not casting calls, the, um, what is it? Man, I can't think of it. The daily. Honey, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, <laughs> uh, you're talking about the day, the schedule thing? Yeah. Who's it? Crap. I suck. I can't think of the name right now, but I think you guys are talking, talking, talking about last but semester. I know what I mean. Oh, frick. Uh, the shot list? No. Call sheet. Call sheet. Yeah, there we so go. The call sheet, the daily schedule of what's happening. Those things can be worked out in advance whenever they, uh, everybody knows what they're doing, or at least the day before is when it's usually worked out. The shooting schedule will be worked out and the days that the actors are needed are also worked out the day out of day. So all of those things have to be worked out in pre-production. So the actor knows when they need to be there and how many days they're being paid for and all of that. So those are all things that are worked out in advance for the most part. On independent productions, it's kind of like the wild west. You never really know depending on what production you're on. On the higher budget stuff, they usually have some, uh, they usually have a little bit more of a unanimous structure of how they do things. It can vary depending on set to set and person to person and who's over it, but they generally run things at least pretty similarly to each other. Whereas in the independent scene, it just really depends on a lot of different factors. All right, moving on from that, we're talking about, uh, we're going to delve a little bit deeper into writing teams and writer rooms. We talked about this a few weeks ago, uh, the hierarchy of different writers and how the showrunners at the top. This stuff comes from nofilmschool.com. It is 
Okay. Oh, it's letter E in the syllabus underneath writing teams and writers rooms for TV. Writers rooms can vary in size from two to 20 people. It really depends on the production, the episode number and the budget. Shows with 24 episodes a season generally have larger rooms and shows with five to 10 episodes usually have smaller rooms with fewer writers. So a room like this that we're seeing in the picture, this is probably for one of those 24 episode um, sitcoms or something like that, where everyone's bouncing ideas off each other and they have to come out with a lot of ideas, a lot of episodes, because many of these writers are going to get assigned an episode to write. That way everybody's off working on their own thing. And then they all come together to give feedback and everything like that. Whereas on a smaller one where they only need 10 episodes, if you have 20 to 30 people in the room, only a half or a third of them are going to get an episode assigned to them. And that's why they don't really need as many. Sometimes you might have that, but typically speaking, less episodes means fewer writers. You have the writing production assistants, writers assistants, staff writers, story editors, executive story editors, co-producers, producers, supervising producers, co-executive producers, executive producers, if they're different from the showrunner, and then the showrunner and script coordinators, all possibly in the writing room. All titles I just said is the hierarchy of writing decisions and approvals, except for the script coordinator and the writer PA. They're not really in the, uh, the writer. The script coordinator coordinates the finished scripts with the rest of the production so that everybody knows what episodes are coming and things like that. The writer PA, the production assistant, will be running tasks. They might be going and picking up things or they might be picking up lunch or they might be um, doing whatever task is needed. They might be printing things, making calls, things like that for the writer's room. And they may be helping the script coordinator get in contact with them when they are off somewhere else trying to get in contact with the writer's room. Um, so it starts with writer's assistants, then it goes to staff writers, then story editors, executive story editors, co-producers, then producers, supervising producers, co-executive producers, executive producers, and then at the very top, the showrunner. And that is how the hierarchy of the, show, of the writer's room usually works and um, who answers to who. Um, except for, you know, some might, they might not go directly to the next person. Like a staff writer isn't going to go to a story editor to, if they have any problems or if they need any, if any have any questions. It's just, that's the next, um, basically the next promotion within the writer's room. Um, coordinators, script coordinators can handle any clearance issues as well that may arise from the script as they prepare the drafts for the production team. So if there's anything they need to clear, any kind of logo or, or line of dialogue or something that might be an issue, they need, they'll, they'll try to find clearance for it and get the legal rights to whatever they're trying to use. We've also discussed this stuff before, but writer's assistants help keep notes and outline the story ideas the writing room comes up with. So they're all in a room, they're coming up with ideas, they're brainstorming. Writers assistants are gonna keep notes and outline each story that they have for each episode. They also might keep track and update the show Bible. And so they'll be the one, someone will be able to one or a few of them will be the ones over the show Bible to make sure that everybody is um, able to look at the thing at any time and it's gonna be as updated as possible to the current state of the show. Staff writers help break the story, break story in the writer's room and develop a more thorough outline of an episode based on the brainstorming sessions. They aren't given credit unless they are assigned to write the episode draft, which they aren't guaranteed to get. So a staff writer is the next step up, but they don't necessarily get to write an ep a full episode. They'll just kind of take the outline and Instead of it being two sentences, they'll break it into even further. They'll get add a bit more detail of what happens within that. You might say the character Charles goes to the store 
and there's a fight outside um, and he gets involved. And that could be like what they came up with in the, in the writing room. And that's what the, the assistant, the writer's assistant wrote. And then the staff writer may take that and they may break it a little bit more and add in details of what happens, how he gets involved um, and if he gets hurt or not. From there, it'll go to a story editor who will actually write out the episode based on what the staff writer or the writer's assistant has given them depending on the writer's room. Story editors, they're like staff writers, but they are guaranteed an episode each season and they get their name in the credits for the one or the multiple ones if they write multiple episodes of the ones that they write. So staff writers, because they aren't actually writing out the entire script, they're just kind of writing out um, a more detailed outline. They don't get credit in the episode. Even when, which kind of sucks. Like they've heard that, uh, I've heard some staff writers say like they came up with really unique ideas that weren't credited to them because they weren't the story editor who actually wrote out the full episode. So it's just something that everybody has to go through when they're in that writing room. They have to get that, come up with ideas, stay on long enough, and then make it to being a story editor eventually. But while you're a staff writer, you're not guaranteed an episode. You're just guaranteed um, that you can help make the ideas for, the, for each episode or for one of the episodes or something like that. Whereas story editors, they actually get an episode assigned to them um, each season. And I think personally, I think that could also be bad depending on what episode you get assigned to you. It might be one that you really didn't chime in on in the writing room which is where like the writing teams kind of get a little uh, difficult is because somebody might come up with an idea and then five other people in the writing room are talking about it. And then it gets assigned to you, even though you didn't really chime in on it. You didn't really like the outline or the idea, but you, you just let it go. Um, and then you get assigned it. Normally that, that doesn't really happen. Normally whoever comes up with the idea who's most passionate about it gets assigned the idea. But if it was just a bunch of staff writers talking about it and the story editors weren't really chiming in, then, you know, one of those story editors might get assigned it and then they'd have to just write it out. So it, it does happen, but typically speaking, it's usually the person who's coming up with the idea and passionate about it and has like the main outline that gets assigned it, um, according to some people, that, I, that some of the sources that we were looking at. In a good writer's room, there are no stupid ideas. Everything can be expressed and any ideas can be thrown around. This is where you have, this is a good way to get a brainstorming session going. You don't want anybody to feel like, oh, I shouldn't say this because it's really stupid. Because even if it is, even if it doesn't work in a brainstorming session, there's so many people that it usually branches off to somebody else and they have an idea that comes out of that. Maybe not that, but maybe this. And they didn't think of that before because they didn't hear that person's idea. And that's why uh, a writer's room is really open and freeing. Um, and a lot of people can just throw out ideas. And that is also why when you're a story editor that gets assigned an episode you didn't like, it's probably because one of those types of things happened where everyone else kind of liked the episode, but you didn't. Um, but you're not gonna shut down the idea for being stupid because that's not how that works because you don't want your ideas to be shut down like that. And you don't wanna make a um, negative feeling in the room. You wanna make sure everybody feels like they can express their ideas and, and give ideas out. And usually there's a discussion back and forth whenever ideas are thrown around. It's not just like somebody says an idea and everybody says, sure. There's so many people you're gonna have a big discussion about most episodes and the ideas. And well, maybe that doesn't work or I don't know. I don't find that funny, but I see where you're coming from. Maybe this and trying to add on to it instead of just completely negating it and saying that it's, a worthless idea, you know, something like that. It'd be more like, hmm, I don't know, maybe, maybe that'll work, but maybe we could do this. And then like either branching away from it a little bit or adding on to it to make it a bit better or something else. 
that helps get writers creative juices flowing and creates a safe space which helps everyone give their ideas out and not feel like they have to hide anything or hold anything back which is not something you want to happen in a brainstorming session of course all the ideas are not going to be used but sometimes like i said ideas that don't work will lead to ideas that do eventually work whether you're branching off from it you're saying i like that half but not that half of the idea or you're just saying, well, no, not that, but that gives me an idea for this instead. In many writing rooms, you'll be seen as not contributing if you aren't throwing ideas around. So a lot of people will just start trying to throw ideas around because you wanna seem like you are contributing to the conversation. If you're just quiet the whole time, uh, then it's, that's not what you should be doing. You should be quiet the whole time in a brainstorming session. You should be having some idea of something or some discussion to add on to somebody else's idea, if nothing else. So a lot of uh, ideas are just thrown around by everybody because that's what it's meant to do to get that those creative juices flowing and get everybody having that conversation about what this is, what the show should be, what these characters are and who they are and what they do, all of those types of things. This stuff comes from In Focus Film School. It's letter G in the syllabus. When in the writer's room, the first week or so, so this is for their specific production and their specific writer's room. Um, so just keep that in mind when I'm talking about all this stuff. But when in the writer's room for their production, the first week or so they said was spent discussing the previous season. So they were in another season. It wasn't their first season. Um, so they were discussing the previous season, what worked, what didn't, the character arcs that are happening or have happened, and other things like that. They said writers will have index cards where they write what happens with each recurring character in the season and put their ideas on the board. This is known as carding in the writing room. So you have character stories and you have Mike, if you look in the middle right here. And you can see everybody has their ideas for what's gonna happen to Mike in this season. Well, uh, in their production, they said like, you know, in the last season, what happened to him? Is he in the middle of a character arc? Did he wrap his character arc up? Or did he just begin a new one? What happened? And then they'll say, okay, what's gonna happen to him in this season? And everybody comes up with ideas, writes it on an index card and goes up to the board and pins it underneath his um his, his character where he is his line of of ideas and then same thing with all these other characters up here like with julie and chuck and all these other characters they have people will just go up and they'll say okay i think chuck should have this i think chuck should do that i think this should happen to chuck and just put all their ideas out there on the board and this is known as carding as i say before pitching ideas for episodes uh Wait, what? Before pitching ideas for episodes, they worked on that. Oh, so before they even started pitching ideas for the episodes in their production, they just worked on what happens to the characters first. And then they started thinking of how is this gonna happen to the characters? What could happen in the episode that causes this to happen? Week two, they began pitching episode ideas one by one. So the first week was spent just thinking of what happened last, last season and um, what are these characters, what is everybody's ideas for what's gonna happen to these characters this season? And then week two, it was everybody's gonna be pitching their episode ideas based on all of this stuff that we went over last week, um, one by one. So each person can have their time to discuss what their episode will be like. They said that in their production, some of the ideas might have been fully developed and others are not as far along, but it doesn't really matter how far along it is. It just matters what the idea is. Um, some people had like a fully fledged idea, almost an entire outline, while other people just had like the very basic paragraph of an idea of this could happen in that episode. Each episode will then receive input from other writers like what could happen, branching off from it, uh, not liking that part, all the stuff I was talking about earlier, that type of conversation happens. 
Some ideas are then dropped or they're pinned for later. Others are accepted and used for part or all of an episode. And that usually is up to the showrunner or if the showrunner is not available, then it goes to the co-executive producer and it just keeps going down the line. Um, I think the supervising producer is the person who can be in charge of the writer's room if none of the people above them are available at the time. But because this is week two of writing, I'm sure the showrunner was there. They should have been anyway. Um, or at least the co-executive producer if the showrunner is working multiple shows at once. So I'm sure somebody was there to be able to, and they're the ones to make the decision of, are we gonna keep this idea or are we gonna not? Does it fit with the rest of the show? And that kind of thing. And then they're gonna lead the writer's room in, into whatever direction that they want the show to go in. Or they, like, like I said, they might take that idea and they say, okay, well, maybe like this will work for half an episode, but I feel like we still need to add to it. I feel like we still need to make a B story or add to this uh, primary A story and just uh, adapt it a bit to make it fit an entire length of an episode because this idea is cool, but it doesn't really seem like it's gonna work for an entire episode and that kind of thing. She said in their production, if your idea was chosen to be a produced episode, you may not be the one, the assigned writer on the draft of it, but typically most of the time you are. So you might, you might have come up with the idea. You might have had a detailed outline and everything. That doesn't mean necessarily mean you're going to get picked to write the episode. But typically, when they came up with their ideas, they were the ones who were picked to write it out because they already knew what they were going for. And if the team liked it, and if the showrunner liked it, then they, will, they want them to write it out to see what you know, the full episode is like. But... That's not always the case. When in the writing room, the team will also break an episode, figuring out what happens in each act, writing each scene on the board. So they'd have like a act one, act two, act three separated. And then they're what happens in scene one, scene two, and scene three. However long the episode is, they'll figure out how many scenes there are and they'll try to break the episode According to this production, anyway, they're breaking the episode in the um, writer's room together. So it's not all up to the, um, in certain productions, it's not all up to the assistant writers or the staff writers to figure out uh, what the outline of the episode will be or to branch off the episode and make it, make it a little bit longer. Sometimes it's just in the writing room that they kind of do the whole thing for that process. All major plot points are figured out for each episode by the writer's team. Once the writers and the showrunner are happy with the episodes, the writers break to write outlines, taking the index cards for their episodes and turning those into notes, turning those notes into 10 page documents outlining the episode. Writers would then meet, give feedback on the episode and make revisions. Outlines are then sent to producers and networks to make sure that they work for them. The producers and networks give their feedback and any required changes. Then the writer makes them, then go on and make the first draft. And for this production, that took them about five to seven days. So that was almost the whole entire second week, or depending on how long they took to um, give out their ideas, it might have been the third week that they were actually writing out the first drafts of the episode. So you write out the outline, people like the outline or not, and they want you to make changes. And then you make those changes and then develop it into a full episode by filling in all, all of the blanks and expanding it out wherever, you, wherever is needed. Um, after they write the first draft, feedback is given and more notes. Then the writer makes the corrections. The draft is then sent in to the producers and the network to give their feedback. And again, changes are made to the script once those changes and feedback come in. So it's a bunch of back and forth. Hey, is this good? No, it should be changed. 
okay, now is this good enough for the network? No, what should be changed? And then just making changes and alterations to the script over and over again. So the writers all need to be, again, it's always important for any writer anywhere, even if you're not in TV, but especially if you're in TV, writing, you need to not be defensive and you need to be able to change things for your story or be able to know when to kind of fight for certain elements if you truly believe that it works for the story the character and the show as a whole uh, you can you can stand up for it and not want to make the changes but in the end of the day you need to just go with whatever the top executives the network studios whatever are telling you you have to do um, if that doesn't work and most of the time you want to just pick your battles and not stand up for every single idea you had because that you need to be able to be easy to work with and standing up for every single idea and being defensive about every single change they want you to make is not a good thing. It's supposed to be very uh, collaborative effort to make these episodes come to life. So something to think about, but it's also good for filmmakers too. If somebody gives you feedback, don't automatically get defensive and say, no, that's stupid. Whether it's your friend or somebody you don't know, uh, it might not work for your story, but you always want to take feedback into consideration and can at least consider making the changes or not. Whereas on TV with the networks, if they're making required changes, obviously you have to make those because it just doesn't, for whatever reason, the network feels it doesn't fit or it's just too risky for their business and they don't want that. Uh, so those obviously have to be made, but the notes and the feedback depending on the production, depending on the show, can be either implemented or not. It just depends on what kind of a hierarchy and production and enforcement happens on that set or in that production. Anyway, after they do the feedback again, they make this, they do the, uh, they make the changes to the script, they send out the second draft, and then it just keeps going back and forth until they say it's ready to be produced. So then the writing team agrees, the networks in the studio agree. And so, okay, this episode is complete. The final draft is done. And this stuff comes from scriptmag.com, it's letter H in the syllabus. With a writing partner or team, there are a few ways to do it. So this also can be applied to film. You can write a film that has just two people writing it, co-writers, or you can do a group of three or four writers. Um, groups are usually left for, for, for uh, TV shows but, or, or a web series, but they can also be do, done with film. But having a writing partner, um, films, films can do that as well. It's like there's plenty of films out there where two people were over most aspects of it working together jointly. So the ways to do it, if you're trying to write with somebody else, um, because there's two minds working on it, you wanna be careful with it first of all, you wanna make sure that you guys aren't going to, like I was saying in the whole writing room thing, you wanna be open, you wanna give feedback, but not be too negative with it. You have to be very careful. You also have to be make sure both of you are equally not gonna be defensive. Uh, about things and take feedback well, because if you're working together to write out a script, you just need to make sure that, you know, maybe you are good with feedback, but if you get a partner that isn't, then all of their ideas are gonna be like, no, I'm gonna keep that because that just makes sense. And everything that they tell you, you'll be like, okay, yeah, maybe. But then that ends up being like all of their ideas stayed in, but your ideas got taken out. So it has to, it's a very uh, fragile, system but it can work depending on the people you just have to make sure that you're getting with the good a good partner but the ways you can do writing with a partner or a team is you do it like a tv show you outline it together and you write it alone so you break the main points the plot points of the story together figure out what's going to happen in act one two and three uh each scene what happens with the character arcs all of the main points and plots you can figure out together and agree upon. And then you go out and you write it alone. So with a film that could be, I'm gonna write this scene, you're gonna write that scene, and we're gonna do that every so often until we finish the whole film. With a show, obviously it's different episodes. You're gonna be writing different episodes. 
You could also outline together and write together. But again, both need to be good at receiving feedback for this to work, because if you're working together, you're actually writing it together. You need to be able to um, work off each other's feedback to make it better. And then there's another way you can outline it together, write it alone, and then you pass it to the other to try to make it better. Pass it back again to try to outdo the other and so on. I can't remember what group they're talking about, but there's a, a duo out there. I think they're on Marvel maybe uh, that make films. And what they do is that they, they write it, they outline what's gonna happen and then they start writing the scenes and then they pass that scene to each other and they try to make it better. They try to up the dialogue, they try to up the action and make it work for the whole film and work for that scene specifically as a whole. And so they just uh, keep doing that over and over again until they're like, wow, you really outdid me. Good job. I, I can't think of a way to improve this. And that way they try to get it to as best of a point as possible. So those are the ways you can do it. Some TV shows will do it where they outline and write it together. Uh, but most of the time, most TV shows will do it where they're outlining together and then they're assigning episodes to the people to go write it out fully. Just depends on the the amount of people in there. Clearly, if you have like two people in your writing room, you might just do any of those three. You might outline it together and write it together in the room, or you might take it and go off and write your own episodes. But if it's multiple people, 24 people, however many, uh, the typical way it works is you guys all get together, brainstorm, outline, figure out the main plot points, and then go off and write your own assigned episodes until they're complete. This last bit comes from collab.sundance.org, collab letter K in the syllabus. One method called sequential writing is a group of writers coming together and break story for an episode. Then one is sent off to write the draft while the next episode is broken down. Then another writer goes off to write that and so on. The person in the actual um, interview that was talking about this method says they don't really like that way because it's diminishing returns. Because in the later episodes in the season, you're only going to have two to three writers in the room to break the story because everybody else is off writing their first drafts for the first episodes. Um, but again, it really just depends from production to production how they want to go about doing it. Some will do it that way, where they're sort of doing it where they're outlining together and writing alone, but the whole team isn't in there for every episode. The whole team's in there until the first episode is outlined and they go, okay, you go ahead, go write episode one. And then they leave the room. All right, now let's figure out episode two, everybody. And then they keep doing that, keep doing that until one by one, all the people are out of the room. And then at the end, by the end episodes, it's only a few people in there to figure out how the season ends. Uh, so they said they don't like that way because they think everybody should be in there for all of the episodes and then be split off to go right. So that other method is what I just said. All episodes I are broken down. I kind of agree down. with that. I mean, I don't know if you're going to touch on like when you, um, I somewhat agree because I feel like that way you have some consistency in the writing and you know like what each person is working on and then you guys can come together and be like hey so I did this I don't know I feel like when there's a lot of writers there should be some um more effort put into meeting and consistency in the writing and working together but I also know that every person has their method and sometimes it's better for them to write and then come together and show the stuff and then work on the stuff together like work on the project that they already have like okay what's your piece and your piece let's try to put it together let's try to brainstorm yeah and so whenever if you were talking about that first method I, I feel like uh they would write it and then they'd all come together to discuss their first drafts and that's when all the feedback would come in but yeah I agree I think I think uh personally I think the other way would work better everybody stays in the room until you break down all of the episodes and figure out the outlines of all of the episodes. And then everybody's sent off to write their own. 
until the, all the first drafts are done and then they come back together to uh that way you can also debate like okay would the character do this would he not be i, I just feel like that's a lot more of a time saver so that you don't waste time writing this and then come together and like oh i don't think this works for the character or, oh i don't think this matches what we already have or what we've already set as precedents yeah and i think sorry go ahead no no, no that's that's what i was going to say Oh, because I think uh, I think the main reason that that method is done is because it's one of those seasons which is going to be filming its first episode while the uh, half of the last season or, you know, further down one of the episodes further in the season is still going to be being written. So they're not fully done with all the writing before they actually start. And that happens on a lot of sitcoms and things that have a bunch of episodes. And that is why that method is done, because it does take time to get feedback, make changes, get feedback, make changes over and over again until it's a final draft. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I agree that if you can, it is better to, if a show can and has the ability, it, it would be better to have everybody in there to give full feedback and contribution until all of the episodes are broken down into outlines and then going in and uh, giving everybody an episode to write. Yeah, I feel like that would, like I said, save a lot of time, effort, and be more productive in the long run. Yeah. And then the last method is group writing, like we already talked about, where multiple writers are given certain scenes, pages, or acts, and then an assigned writer looks over it to be sure it all works together. So that can also happen in TV, uh, where, you know, you give two to three writers each 10 pages to write, 15 pages to write, or you break it down by scenes, however many scenes you have, you divide that evenly, or by acts, you write act one, you act write two, or two, three, four, five, however many acts you have in that episode, uh, you're gonna write this one. And then there's an assigned writer over the episode, which is just kind of like a overviewer who, who looks over all of the different writing and makes sure it all works together, makes sure it matches the show, and makes any changes as necessary, but that way they're not doing all of the work for the entire episode. So sometimes when you have a lot of different people working on it, you might have multiple writers working on one episode at a time. Other times you'll have um, everybody breaking it down and then writing their own episode. And then other times you'll have everybody in there at the start. Once you break down the first episode, somebody gets sent off to write it. And that just keeps happening until you're at the end of the season with however many people are left. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or anything to add about writing rooms or writing teams? All right, yeah, so I think the main thing is just make sure you keep your ego in check. Make sure you are able to receive feedback well and work as a team doing it. And don't think you are a god with your ideas. I would, I would <laughs> all the time. And I think that the best thing for you, the best way for you to go into this and not have your feelings hurt or not feel defensive is the mentality of we are a team. We are working in this together all for the good of the project. We are all trying to make this project the best it can be so if there is a critique a criticism or something that we don't agree on or that they would like to change it is nothing personal to me or to my work it is just them trying to help me create the best product possible i feel yeah. like that that mentality just helps you detach yourself a little bit of course we can never fully detach ourselves it's our babies our creation it's personal in some way but i feel like when you go into the into it with that mindset it just makes a huge difference because you know you don't feel attacked you don't feel like you are having to defend some or protect something that's yours this is a group effort a team effort and we're all we're all working together and we're all working towards the same goal of making the best product possible. So Exactly. All right. Moving on from that, we're talking about film markets. And this comes from videomaker.com. It is letter E in the syllabus. 
Oh, before that, the way you communicate too. If you are a writer and you are working with another writers and you're working with other writers, the way you communicate with those other writers, there's there's a way to communicate. That is something that if you're gonna be working in a writer's team, if you're gonna be working with multiple people, you need to work on your communication as well. It can't just be the other person has to understand this. Like sometimes, more often than not, like my brother always says this, it's not what you say, it's what the other person understands. And that sucks sometimes because people understand different things. But at the end of the day, it's like, um, try to understand or at least know the communication style or, or ask questions, the people that you're working with. And so you can understand their communication style a little better. So you know how to communicate with them in a way that your point comes across and it doesn't seem defensive. It is a little annoying sometimes having to walk on eggshells or having to mind your words um, and word things in different ways so that people understand. Some people are more sensitive or have different communication styles than others. But in the long run, everyone's different and put, be having that self-awareness as well of how can I communicate this in the most productive way possible? Not, oh, without hurting their feelings, but in a way that's actually going to be productive for this and not just going to end up petty or um, feel like I'm go, um, talking badly about their work or whatever. So try to think and think about the most productive way you can approach a conversation as well and not just, uh, and just flat out state your opinion. Yeah, you know, communication is key and everything. So, yeah. especially in writing and feedback, and um, you know, the brainstorming session needs to be open and environmentally friendly. So you need to make sure that it is uh, has a nice environment. I mean, like not environmentally friendly, but has like a good environment. Everybody feels like they're able to communicate, open and talk and discuss whenever they feel like it. Have a question. Have a, a difference of opinion. All of those things need to feel like they're able to have that uh, and nothing should be like getting shot down as like a, unless it's like intentionally harmful then of course, but other than that, you should be uh, open and, and safe. It should be a safe space to have ideas flow so that everybody can be creative with it. And if you guys get into an impasse, put it into a vote. If it's like a larger writer's room or if you have like a producer or a, head, a showrunner, getting in a, a third, an extra opinion or putting it to a vote really helps because sometimes there are gonna be moments where there will be compromise and okay, the vote, let's say there's like five writers to like my idea, like me and one other person like my idea, but the other three don't, I'm going to have to just swallow it and be like, okay, well, we put it to a vote. Let's just move on. And I'll try to help with the next project or, or, or try to keep writing. Just let it go and keep writing. Or maybe uh, even use that idea for like another project that you can work on in the future. Not, not everything can be thrown away too. Oh yeah, that was actually something they were talking about when we were talking about uh, um, the writing teams is some of the ideas the showrunner will pin for later and then they'll actually pick up on it either later in the season or they'll pick up on it in a different season. Cause they're like, oh, you know what? I like that idea. And that's something in our, kind of like putting it on the back burner for if they need it, they'll use this idea that was out, but they don't want it for right now because from where the show is at now, it doesn't work. Um, and then, you know, and so your idea might be picked up later if you're in a writing room, if they're pinning your idea and leaving it for another time. So there's also that. But anyway, moving on from that, we're talking about film market. Specifically, this stuff's going to be about American film market, but there are others. Uh, European film market, Cannes, which is France uh, film market. There's a bunch of different film markets out there. Um, the one main for us would be American film market. So this stuff comes from video, videomaker.com. It is letter E in the syllabus. Film festivals are events for their community there to show films and to try to win awards and things like that. Film markets are more like trade shows. Every year, the American film market closes the Lowe's Hotel in Santa Monica to travelers. 
and turns it into an eight story complex of offices by production and distribution companies from all over the world. All bedding is removed and replaced with office furniture furnishings. Um, and so they just completely revamped this hotel to make it more of a office space, a trade show area. And that is where this American film market is held currently each year. With film festivals, you have to apply, send in your film, and then see if you're accepted into the festival. With film markets, if you want to take your film to the market, you're welcome to do so. If it's deemed good enough to sell, then it will sell, hopefully. In 2016, there were 7,000 attendees of AFM or American Film Market. So if you hear AFM, that's just American Film Market, EFM, European Film Market, and so on. At festivals, the largest ones can attract tens of thousands of people, the majority of whom are not in the actual movie industry, but just like to watch movies and support independent creators by watching their stuff, seeing what's, what's out, what's new. Whereas, uh, in the film markets, there's, a, there's still a lot of people, but there's not as many at all. There's a lot less because it's all for buyers and sellers of film. So 7,000 at AFM in 2016. Uh, so it could have grown by now, but still it will be a lot less than you would get at a major film festival. They also say, uh, videomaker.com, they say sometimes festivals can be bad for your film when unqualified members and amateur reviews are posted about your film, sometimes in real time, where prospective buyers have the opportunity to hear what others think before they even see the film themselves. And so they might start already forming their, conclude, their own conclusions. Um, so sometimes for certain films, especially, uh, it might be better just goes directly to the market and try to skip the festival because if you start getting negative reviews from people who um, didn't understand your film or didn't like it for whatever reason, then they will start posting about it and having their reviews shown to people and it, the word will start getting out a little bit more. And that might give you a negative impact on being able to sell it if you then later take it to the market to try to sell it to a distributor or a studio or something like that. Because they'll be like, well, these people don't like it. They're all saying that it's not good, even though maybe they weren't your target audience. Because you never know who's going to show up to a film festival and if they are going to be your intentional audience or not. And so if you are intending to show it to a certain, um, certain target audience, then you'll never know who's going to be there at a festival and you'll never know what their reactions are going to be. So if they are having negative reactions to it, that could negatively impact your ability to sell it later. Whereas if you took it directly to the market, you might be able to get somebody who likes it. If you've done your research on the distributors and stuff, you know what they specifically distribute. You might go to one that fits your film perfectly and they might like it a lot more than the film festival attendees would. So you never really know. Um, but if your intention is to sell it, Typically, they said you might, you might want to bring it to a film market first if it's like an independent project. I would also, I would point out though that sometimes um, that can be good if the film is received well, of course. So even from amateur reviewers, it can obviously also be bad if it's received negatively from the same people. But if you bring it to a festival first and it's received well, then you just up the chances of your film being sold at the market so there are there is that there's always that you could either get negative or you get positive reviews if you get positive your chances of selling it are higher and at a higher price if your reviews are negative whether that was your intended audience or not uh your price would probably either come down or you just have a worse chance of selling it um Videomaker.com, they also say that there are films sold at festivals, but they generally don't fetch as much money as those at the three main film markets. Selling films isn't the main goal at festivals, whereas at film markets, their sole goal is to bring buyers and sellers of entertainment together. 
they point out that their interviewee says film markets are becoming obsolete and says the model needs to be updated. So lately with online distribution and things like that, film markets aren't as necessary because you can send it over. Um, but there is something to it of being in person and having a deal done compared to just trying to do it online, whether it's even through video or email, especially. Um, the less you have with contact and like actual physical contact or being able to talk and hear intonations and uh, things like that, the less chance you have of getting a, a good deal, whereas you might be able to have a good chemistry with somebody and get um, a good conversation flowing about the film if you meet them in person. So it's uh, it can be good. It can be very good or it can not really help. And it's, uh, you can do the whole thing online. It really just depends on your film and what you're trying to do with it, where you're trying to get it sold and those kinds of things. Um, the film market season starts in November. That's when AFN in Santa Monica, California starts. And the film market season wraps in late May at Cannes, France with their um, film market. The European film market is held early to mid-February. So you have American film market in November, European film market in mid-February, and the uh, Cannes, I don't know what they call it, but their film market happens in late May. The next bit of information comes from Magda Olchowska.com. Film festivals can be combined with film markets and the trend is increasing in the industry across the world because it's more convenient. So you can also have the major film festivals are attached to different film markets now. Um, film markets are not cheap since you will need to rent exhibition space and a screening room from the organizers to try and sell your film. You can also try to get pre-sales at film markets before your film is even made or before you've started production. And so getting pre-sales, some people will go there just to pitch ideas and pitch things that they want to do. And others will go there to try to pitch their film that they've already made to try to get it sold. And so those are the two uh, types of deals that usually happen in film markets. So next thing comes from setheroapp.com. There are four stages of film market selling. There's booking the meetings, delivering a sales pitch, creating a media kit, and selling your film. Um, if you're an independent filmmaker, it's advised you hire an experienced sales agent, producer, or a producer rep, because they're going to know the people, they're going to have connections already, they're going to know what the deals are good and what's not, they're going to know how to pitch things, they're going to know a lot more information than you will, and so it's always better for you to have somebody experienced that knows what they're doing, whether it's a sales agent, a producer rep, or just a producer on your film, if they have experience selling and distributing independent films, or, or at least selling it to a distributor to distribute it. There are thousands of buyers, so you need to do your homework to figure out which are going to fit best with your film. Most buyers, buyers being distributors in this instance, so there are thousands of buyers, it's thousands of distributors. So you need to do your homework to figure out what, which ones fit best with your film. Most buyers have all their meetings booked before the market even begins. So you wanna make sure to book your meetings in advance because that'll set you apart from other independent filmmakers who go to these film markets and attend with the hope of securing a meeting the day of. So they hope they're gonna run across somebody um, and they're gonna get a meeting. But typically speaking, a lot of the, especially the bigger distributors, they all get booked out in advance. So you wanna try to do your homework as early as possible to figure out which distributors you want to try to book a meeting with. And then you want to uh, obviously try to book a meeting with them as early in advance as possible from when the actual um, film market, the, American film market in this instance 
in November before it actually happens, you want to have a meeting booked with whoever you're trying to go for. The AFM film catalog will have a list of all the attending buyers a month before the market begins. So each year, a month before they have their, um, their event, which is the uh, trade show event, the film market, before they do that, they have who's going to be there. And that is the time to look into them and figure out which ones fit, which ones don't, and do it as quickly as possible. Because like I said, they start getting booked up and then they aren't going to have any meetings or any schedules of scheduling available unless some of their meetings drop out or go shorter than they expected. So you always wanna to try to do that stuff right when you can, right? When they release the information, you wanna start looking into it. Who, you know, who does my budget level? Who distributes my genre that I'm in? Who distributes with inexperienced or experienced people like me um, or my crew? All of those different questions you need to look at and you need to see, is this going to fit with this distributor? Because if it's not, you shouldn't even try to set up a meeting with them. They probably won't set up a meeting with you anyway, because they're going to already know that your pitch doesn't match them, but you're wasting time that you could have tried pitching to somebody else earlier. So you always want to go after the ones you feel like fit best first. And then if you have extra time, you think, uh, you can try to book with some people that are kind of secondary, like maybe they would, maybe they won't. But the main ones, the main ones that feel like they distribute your exact kind of film, uh, those are the ones you have to want to go after as quickly as possible to try to set up a meeting. The AFM recommends making a list of 30 to 40 target companies that you want to pitch to or try to set up an, a meeting with. You can try scheduling meetings by contacting buyers by email and then following up by phone. When you get meetings set up, you'll want to make a sales pitch with a brief breakdown of the film genre, synopsis, and your intended target audience. So when you're actually doing your sales pitch to them, you want to explain what your genre is, you wanna explain the synopsis or the main overview of your movie, what is it about, in a general, small, as small as you can, a uh, little bit maybe like a paragraph, but like a log line and a synopsis and things like that to really just get the information across quickly. And then your intended target audience, who you think would watch this film, um, whether it's people from other countries, whether it's Americans from this certain area, whether it's this certain age, whatever. Whatever your target audience is, you want to explain that as well. The best pitches are friendly, organized, and straightforward. You don't want to blabber on about your film and why it's great. You want to get it across quickly and concisely so they can have a good overview of what it's about and then make an easy decision on if they want to learn more. And if they want to learn more, that is when you start explaining more. But you want to give them something quick up front because they have a lot to look through at these events. You have a lot to do at these events. So you don't really want to waste time by over explaining something if they're not even interested from the start. Sometimes that'll work, but most of the time it won't. If they're not interested in the main pitch, uh, they typically aren't going to be interested as you expand upon it. The meetings tend to last for about 10 to 15 minutes. So if you go to somebody and you're doing a meeting with them, it's a really quick thing. It's 10 to 15 minutes. Explain your story. We'll have a little chat about it, and then we'll decide what we want to do, if we want to get your full script or what. Be sure to arrive, if you are doing setting up meetings and everything, be sure to arrive to those meetings early and don't schedule meetings too close together. There's multiple floors. You don't wanna to have to be wasting time. You scheduled it 10 minutes from the other one or too close together to the other one. And the other meeting went on longer than you thought it would. And that other meeting that you're supposed to be at in five minutes now is on the other side of the hotel at the bottom floor and you're at the top on the you know, on the right side and you have to go to the bottom on the left like that's going to take time so you don't want to be late for a meeting so they say if you're scheduling meetings don't schedule them too close together really look at how far apart they might be from each other um, and just give yourself time to get there if you don't if they don't have like a map or an area of telling you where what room they'll be in yet and you still want to try to just uh schedule the meetings for far enough apart to be able to get to them in time and you want to get to them early too because it looks professional. 
AFM does provide screening rooms for hire, which is just a movie theater room that you can rent out to showcase your film. However, it's unlikely that a buyer will have time to watch the whole thing. So they might want to watch a few minutes. They might want to watch a trailer. And usually you're, you probably won't need a screening room for that. So you don't always have to get out those and rent out a screening room to uh, get buyers interested. You should bring an online media kit that has several marketing items. That would be clips of the scenes from the film to show its quality. Pick ones that best illustrate the film. AFM recommends preparing four to six minutes of selected scenes and then send that to buyers before the meeting on a password protected site like Vimeo. That way they have access to it and they can look at it um, before they even get to the meeting. <clears throat> or they can pull it up while you're in the meeting, I guess, if, if you send it to them right before. Media kit can also include photos, posters, trailers, page breakdown of the film synopsis, so like a longer version of the synopsis, and details on the producer, director, and actors attached. So who they are, what they've done before, and that kind of stuff. You'll wanna also have a lot of business cards to hand out throughout the event as well. So if you run into anybody and uh, they aren't really doing anything, you can say, hi, this is me, and this is what I've done. You know, here's my card. You can look us up on this site or you can call me here, email me, whatever. So you want to have a lot of business cards to hand out. It's a business agreement, it's a business event. Most formal agreements are likely to happen after the market, even when offers are made at the event. So that is why the meetings only last, you know, 10 to 15 minutes because you're pitching them the general idea they're picking up on it and they like it and they might want you to send a script over and um, they might even spend a long time with you. If they really like the film, they might spend, you know, 30 minutes with you doing, going over a bunch of stuff like the, like the script, part of the movie, stuff like that. But then they're going to want the actual stuff after the market event is over to really go through it and to do a formal agreement with all the legalities like this uh, contracts and everything else that has to be signed and all the agreements with that, that'll be worked out after. So you don't really have to worry about um, getting stuck with one person and staying there the whole time because these things last a few days. So you're usually going to have like an offer or interest in it, and then they're going to follow up with you once the event is over. After the market, there will be several weeks of negotiations if buyers want to buy your film. It's also always good to keep in mind that it's best to turn down an offer rather than accept a bad deal. So you don't want to just accept an offer because it's the only one you've received. If it doesn't seem like it's a good deal, it's oftentimes better to just turn it down. Um, and so, you know. Uh, a few people were recommending like at these events, they are screened. The um, you can't call yourself a buyer without being like pre-screened and everything. So they most of the time they're all going to be legitimate. But that doesn't mean that they're not going to try to shorthand you with some kind of bad deal, you know, or try to get the best deal for themselves as possible, like they should be. Uh, and so you don't want to just take a deal right then and there. You want to wait and see if, especially because when you're on a market like that, you can go to a next pitch. And if they like it too, now you have two interested companies going after your film. And that's just better for you. You have more leverage. Well, they said they'll give me this for it. Well, you, are you going to go up or are you going to, you know, you're going to up your bid? Are you going to change this uh, deal that we talked about? Are you going to give me more rights? You know, what's going to happen now? And then you have two people or more bidding after your movie. And that's always good for you. So you never want to accept a deal right when you get it. You just want to say thank you and um, I'll email you and we'll discuss this further later after the market is done. Um, the AFM offers a range of prices from about $300 for a single day pass to upwards of $1,500 for a premium week's pass. So you can go on AFM and you can see what that means. 
what the different perks are. You know, some of them are like you have the option to screen in a room. Some of them are you just have the option to be there and set up meetings. So there's different perks to different levels of how, uh, what kind of pass you get. But the $1,500 one is going to be like the whole, the whole week. I think it's like a three to five day event. Uh, and so that would be like you get all of the perks and you're there for the entire time. The other one is like, I'm going to be there for a single day and I'm going to try to sell my film on that day or I'm trying to get people interested on that day. And then I will discuss it with them later. And that would be about $300. And if you're bringing a group of people, obviously it's 300 per person. So it can get expensive pretty quickly depending on what you're trying to do. A booth at the event in 2019 costs $6,400 for the week. So if you're trying to set up a booth specifically for your film, um, now it's probably more than that, but it was $6,400 in 2019 for the whole week. So that's something else you'd have to add on to the cost if you were going to do something like that. If you choose to rent a screening room, you didn't buy a pass that has the option to it, or if you have the option to do it, you still have to pay the screening room fee. That would be around $1,500. So there's a lot of costs to it. If you're getting interest in it, that's a good thing. But if you do get requested to show it on a screen, uh, that will cost money to rent out a screen to do that. Then there's also hotel travel and expenses for you or your team. So you have to think about all that as well, food and all of that. In 2020, the market was held online and online film markets may take over further as it's cheaper, but time will only tell. Again, they were saying, you know, they, it might take over online because they did it in 2020 due to COVID, but Certain people, a lot of people felt like it wasn't as interactive. It wasn't as good because you couldn't get a read on people as well. So you couldn't really negotiate. You couldn't have a good um, discussion and, and really express your film and pitch it the best way you can, which is in person almost all of the time. Um, if you're good at doing pitches, that is the best way to do it is in person. So We'll see what happens, you know, the future, they may just change it all to being online or they may completely combine it with all festivals and say only festivals slash film markets instead of having it be a separate event, but who knows. Also, you never wanna spend more than you can afford to lose at a film market trying to sell your film because you may not even get a deal. So you always have to think about that. Just because you go to this event, bring your film, you think it's going to be a success, you think it's going to be a, a great sale, it doesn't mean you're going to get a deal. Even if you got all of your meetings with every single distributor you thought would be perfect fit, it doesn't mean it's going to work out. So you don't want to spend more money than you can afford to lose. You don't want to take out a loan to try to go to this event if you're not going to be able to pay it back and all the things like that. So just be careful uh, with money. You should have been careful from this whole way through, you know, <laughs> with making the film in general, but also be careful with going to this event and, and uh, spending more money than you can afford to lose on that. And that is why it is important to factor in distribution costs into your budget originally. This is part of the distribution costs, going to these types of events, the film markets, film festivals, all of those cost money to either apply to or go to and attend. So you need to keep all that stuff in mind and budget that into your original budget from the start so that you have money left over from your original budget to do these things. To do these things. Oh, um, also before I forget, cause I almost forgot during the meeting, um, I shared a book the other week. I think it was last week. It's called The Pocket Lawyer for Filmmakers. I shared it on the group and I told Coda to share it through email, but he told me to remind everyone in the meeting. It, um, it talks about what we were talking about last week with contracts and negotiations, and I'm pretty sure it also had a chapter on distribution rights and that kind of thing, and like how to negotiate 
and and all that. So um, I know it has like not very little to do with this one, but it, the distribution thing reminded me. So gotcha. if yeah. you guys are interested, I haven't finished reading it yet. We skimmed through it and it's one of the books on our read list, but um, I skimmed through it and it looked really interesting having to do with last week's and, the, and this whole semester really that we've been talking about. It's called The Pocket Lawyer for Filmmakers, a legal toolkit for in independent producers. And it's by Thomas, Thomas A. Crowell and it has ESO, something like that. ESQ, yeah. yeah. It's the second yeah. edition that we have, but yeah, it has a lot of legal information about like, you know, music and contracts and um, talent releases and things like that. And it explains a lot of those different things that we might have questions about. Um, so we had this book for a while, but we just moved and we found it again. So we're gonna try to see if we can read over it. I do not know if it has a PDF, it could. You'd have to look it up though. You can try looking it up on um, e eBay. Sometimes we'll have like really cheap Kindle versions, like PDF versions. Actually, I think it says, if I can get on, how do I get out of this? Oh, here we go. Uh, I think right here, buy digital. Yeah, Amazon, you can buy the digital version. Um, and most of the time it's pretty cheap. It's somewhere like um, digital versions. Last time I checked were pretty cheap. They were like five, six, eight. I the, the most expensive I've ever seen for a digital is like eight to 10 bucks. And that's for like the 600 page one. So I don't know. Well, this one's showing about 39 to 37 bucks for the uh, digital book. Really? Wow. But that's on Google Play Books, Barnes and Noble, oh, and Kobo, okay. so well, it could be normally, different price on different. Yeah, sites. normally I look through Amazon Kindle and through eBay. Those are where I used to buy my digital copies and PDFs, and they were a little cheaper. But at the end of the day, like, um, if you if you can afford it, it's always great to try to get the original, and not like a copied PDF version. There is a difference. There, um, I've, I speak from experience, um, they use the spelling on some of the books or they, they are, there are parts that aren't on there that are missing. So just, just make sure that you're looking for, that they have the same amount of pages, that the um, letters aren't different so that it's not just like a copied and pasted Kindle version that someone took and then sold, you know? Because those can have a few little mistakes, and you might not get, you know, what you, what you want. So just be careful, because there's even even with digital copies, you can run into those little issues. Yeah, that's a that's a book we'll be reading through, uh, hopefully soon, to just kind of go over some of this. It talks about copyright stuff and other things like that. So it's really cool, really interesting for all of this like business side of film uh, that not many people talk about. Anyway, going back to film markets. So um, that is why you want to factor in your distribution costs because attending this event does cost money. And so you want to have that in your budget from the very beginning so that you have enough money to go ahead and go to it. You're not spending out of pocket even more to attend it because you don't, again, you don't know if you're going to get a deal or not from it. You also want to get an uh, entertainment lawyer if you can. You normally don't need them until after the market when the formal contracts and deals are made though. At the actual event, that is why you never wanna like accept a deal right there, then and there, uh, cause that's pretty sketchy. So you wanna, you wanna. Oh yeah, and that's a huge red flag. If they're trying to be like, hey, I don't have time, but I saw this and I might be able to do a last minute deal with you. Or if they try to rush you into the deal without like proper scheduling, proper negotiations, like we've said a million times sketchy as heck red flag don't even have time to research them it's yeah Be and careful. like i said the uh the markets will themselves will screen the people that the people calling themselves buyers or the distributors uh and they will screen them for legitimacy and things like that so you generally don't have to worry about that as much as you would if you just tried to sell it online to a distributor um because this event will actually um, like go through people and, and screen check them, but and screen them, I mean, but you you still want to keep your you know your 
still want to be aware of it just in case it does happen to you. You want to be aware that uh, that is not a normal thing. You, you don't sign a deal right then and there at these types of events. You have a formal contract and everything. You get a bid or you get an offer and then you expand upon that or they contact you and you get in further communications, further negotiations after the event is over. Buyers in, like I just said, buyers in most markets are pre-screened and accredited. They don't just let anyone claim to be a buyer. You have to have certain credentials and things like that to be able to, or I have previous, previously bought films and other stuff. There's different things they screen for, but uh, depending on the market, they might screen for different criteria. But either way, it's going to be a more legitimacy than you would have if you just went out or went online to any old film market or answered any email that came your way. Um, so that is, a, that is another good thing I would say about going to these actually actual events is it's, it's more legitimate. You, it's a bit safer, uh, even though you still might not get the best deals out there and you have to like negotiate to get it down. It's going to not be as many, if any, scams as you might get from other places. But just like with anything, you should always be mindful of any bad deals and offers, because even if it's a legitimate company, they can still give a bad deal or a bad offer because they're trying to get their best deal they can, which is why there should be a negotiation. There's also some deals that happen at festivals like Toronto, Sundance, and others. There's also many deals that happen at Cannes, which acts as a festival and a market. So at Cannes, there most people know about it as the festival, but it also has a simultaneous film market happening in the generally same area at the same time. Uh, so that's one of those combined ones, and it happens uh, simultaneously. And most people don't really know about the film market aspect because they're not going to that. They don't go to that to buy films or sell films because they're not actually in the movie industry. They are going to the festivals to watch the movies. That's the majority of the attendees. Everyone else uh, that is actually having a film that they want to sell or is actually a distributor that want to buy films, they will probably be attending one, uh, the marketplace or both the festival and the marketplace going back and forth because it's usually like a, a again, like a week long event or something like that. That said, don't be afraid. Like even though we're saying, oh, be careful with this, be careful with that or watch out. Don't be afraid to mingle and to make connections and to, you know, um, that's one of the reasons you're going there too, is to be able to get your work out there and to um, network. Yeah. And you can also sell your film outside of the market as well. So you don't absolutely need to go to the film market to be able to sell it. It's just an, a place that's specifically for it. So it does give you somewhat of an advantage because there are tons of people looking to buy films as well as tons of people looking to sell them. And that is the event to have those people meet. And that is why that event happens. And that is all I have on that. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or anything to add? Film markets. We'll talk more about film festivals and how like some can be sketchy as well because some of the lesser known ones or the brand new ones, um, they all, charge some application fees so some of them are just out there to get that and they don't really have a real legitimate festival i mean they have like sort of a festival but we'll talk about that more in another meeting when we get to it but for the the film markets um those are generally going to be the ones that are the big the big name ones are the most legitimate any brand new film markets, you never know what you're going to get, just like with anything else. So the main ones are like AFM, EFM, whatever the one that's, that takes place in Cannes, France. And uh, I think there's a Chinese one. And there's multiple other ones that are like the major ones. And you can look up a list of them to see what the major film markets are. But, it, but the other thing about that is if you are actually trying to go out to these events, you got to keep travel in mind, all those costs. So if you know before you make the movie that you want to go to the European film market to try to sell it as well, uh, 
just know that you're going to have to fly out there and whoever you're bringing is going to have to fly out there as well. And, so, and you have to have a hotel and pay for the event. So all of those costs and things need to keep in mind when you're beginning to make your first film or your second film or third film or whatever film you're on, if you're going to try to sell it at a market. If you're just trying to gain notoriety and win awards and get your name out there, film festivals are usually the way to go. Whereas if you're trying to sell your film and make money from it or make your money back, film markets might be the better way to go. Just depends your experience and uh, how many, how, what your budget level is and what your experience level is. So keep all that stuff in mind. Last thing I'm gonna say is that Monday, we are going to be watching a movie for its production design. This time we are gonna be paying specific attention to the concepts of the film, the ideas that were presented oh, in the concepts. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I was just gonna remind everyone, I did do the, um, I, I found a few behind the scenes things on the film we watched last time. There wasn't much online, um, but there was a little bit to where like I some stuff that I thought was interesting just for curiosity's sake and some stuff that um, I thought like had to do with like the production design and the colors and all that. So I'll be sending that uh, this weekend. Cool. Um, and also I found out, I tried not to research a lot about it. Found out it was a Baz Luhrmann film, explained a lot <laughs> about why I was like, this feels a bit acid trippy and now i know why <laughs> the great gatsby <laughs> yeah yeah it was interesting but yeah so monday we're going to be watching a movie again and then we're going to base another exercise that will be due june 30th as well on that well not exactly on that but on the production concept um so that'll be either like a mood board or a lookbook that we will create to try to convey an idea, a look, and a style of a project that we might have in mind or that we just create on the spot for this, uh, for this exercise. And so that'll be our second exercise. It'll be due June 20th, the one with color, and then the one for concept and creation. 